Well, hello, everyone. I uh, hope you're having a fabulous day. Uh, this is Let Us Reason, and I'm Al Fadi. And with me here, uh, our fabulous brother, David Wood. I'm sure probably all of you know who he is, but if you don't, shame on you. Uh, you need to go and check him out on his uh, own channel, Act 17 Apologetics, on YouTube. Uh, my ch channel, of course, is here international, but we are going also live on Facebook. Uh, my page is alfadi.sira, alfadi.sira, uh, that's C as in Charlie, C-I-R-A. Today's topic is going to be an interesting topic. Um, you've seen the, uh, the, uh, the advertisement for it already, uh, why the Quran was revealed in Arabic. And really, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting question, of course. I am a former Muslim who speak Arabic. I grew up and was born and raised in Saudi, the heartland of Islam. And I remember times when I would ask questions about something in the Quran because it wasn't clear. And I also remember times when the people I'm asking, like my teacher, the religion teacher, uh, you know, or somebody in the mosque, they would chastise me for even trying to make up my own opinion about it. And they will refer me to the Islamic traditions. And that's why David is with me here. David, welcome, of course, brother. Thank you Hi. for making time for us. How are you doing, brother? I'm doing fine. And you did a really a short video. I mean, I want to point people to it. Uh, that has that title, actually. It was uh, it was a while back. You looked much younger, so it was confusing to me. Yeah, that was uh, that was several years ago. But I think uh, I think it's time to start revisiting the topic because I think this is one of the most important topics uh, for pointing out the problems with what Muslims believe about the Quran. And so it's something where I'm like, yeah, I made a video on this years ago, but no, we need to keep, we need to keep hammering this home until Muslims uh, finally uh, tell us what's going on here. So David, you know, from your perspective, uh, you know, uh, as someone uh, who supposedly, according to Muslims, don't know Arabic, right? I mean, that's the argument, that's a fault, uh, the fallback they're gonna use. Um, what prompted you into doing that video, which is basically discussing the idea that why is the Quran revealed in Arabic in the first place? Yeah, well, uh, as you know, um, the fallback position whenever we criticize Islam is, well, the Quran only works in Arabic and you don't know Arabic, so you can't understand it. And so notice that, that Muslims on the one hand are telling us, hey, this is the, the easy to understand religion for all people. It's the final, the Quran is the final revelation and everyone needs to go to this revelation and, and believe in our religion. And then supposedly we can all understand it. And we know how to convert to it and we know what to believe. But as soon as we start saying, hey, hold on, I got, I got a problem here. This isn't making sense. Then it comes out, ah, oh, well, you can't question or challenge anything because it only works in Arabic and you can't understand it. And so you, you see the problem here. It's, it's if, if they're telling us that, that the Quran can only be understood in Arabic, then basically we have two options. We can either, we can either believe what Muslims say, what, Arab, what Arabic speaking Muslims say about the Quran and just believe whatever they said. And that's going to raise problems because if we're just believing what a Muslim says, well, which Muslim? Do we believe, you know, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi before he was before he was killed? Do we believe the, the nice Muslim down the street? Do we just pick whichever Muslim we like best or whichever Muslim is, is closest to our own personal views and, and go with what he said? Do we go with do we go with Zakir Naik? Do we go with Yasser Qadi? Who, who do we go with? Um, do we go with Salafis? Do we go with Shias, Sunnis? Who, who, how do we know? So the idea here is, um, Muslims are all pointing to each other, accusing themselves of, of accusing each other of being heretics and so on. And so how do, how do we know if they're, how do we know who's the, the true Muslim and who's the heretic if we can't understand, if we can't understand the book and the religion as a standard to be able to say, oh no, this is the group that's not living up according, not living according to what the book says. This group over here is living according to what the book says. So we're going to go with the with that group, if we can't understand it, it's basically what, what do we what do we go with? Do we go with whichever whichever group we like best or whatever one's nicest? We have no way of knowing who to follow. So if on the one hand, the solution to the Quran only working in Arabic is to just listen to what Arab Muslims say. Well, they're all Arab Muslims who would tell us all kinds of different things about Islam. So how can we be expected to just trust them? So that's one option. The other option is that in order to, to actually understand the Quran, we would have to, of course, spend years of our lives studying 
Arabic, learning exactly. classical Arabic. Yeah. Exactly. And, and I, I, I'd like to get your view on this, Al Fadi, because there are various, uh, there are various um, people who, who, who do know Arabic and who do know the Quran in Arabic who, who say that the Quran is actually hard, really, really hard to understand even in Arabic. Let me give a couple quotations here. So this is from an Arabic scholar, Gert Poulin, who's the one who, uh, he's, a, he's a manuscript scholar of, uh, of the Quran. And he says, the Quran claims for itself that it is mubin or clear. But if you look at it, you will notice that every fifth sentence or so simply doesn't make sense. Many Muslims and Orientalists will tell you otherwise, of course, but the fact is that a fifth of the Quranic text is just incomprehensible. This is what has caused the traditional anxiety regarding translation. If the Quran is not comprehensible, if it can't even be understood in Arabic, then it's not translatable. People fear that, and since the Quran claims repeatedly to be clear, but obviously is not, as even speakers of Arabic will tell you, there is a contradiction. So that's Gert Puin. And then we have, of course, the, the famous Ali Dashti in his book, 23 Years, says, the Quran contains sentences which are incomplete and not fully intelligible without the aid of commentaries, foreign words, unfamiliar Arabic words, and words used with other than the normal meaning, adjectives and verbs inflected without observance of the concords of gender and number, illogically and ungrammatically applied pronouns which sometimes have no referent, and predicates which in rhymed passages are often remote from the subjects. These and other such aberrations in the language have given scope to critics who deny the Quran's eloquence. So here's the situation uh, for, for me is Muslims are saying, oh, you, you can only see the great wonders and beauty of the Quran in, in, in Arabic. And then I have people who know Arabic saying, uh, this is actually a really horrible book. So who am I going to listen to here? Am I going to listen to the Muslims exactly. who say it's a, it's a wonderful book and no one can write anything like it. It's so wonderful. Or do I listen to the non-Muslims who say, no, this book has some serious problems. I find it difficult to listen to the Muslims because it's the same Muslims who say that there are all these scientific miracles and that the Quran's been perfectly preserved. In other words, I have reason to think that they just always say whatever glorifies Islam in spite of the evidence. Um, and so who, who am I going to go with here? But what, what's your view on this since you read the Quran well, in Arabic? You know, absolutely. And, and here's one of, one of the, the comic things. By the way, uh, uh, Gert Poen is absolutely right. And guess what? I spoke to the guy two months ago. Yeah. We Skyped, he and I, for over an hour. The guy speaks Arabic in an unbelievable way. But he also knows that even with his proficiency in Arabic, that he will get the tendency to be attacked that, oh, you're a German. How would you know mm -hmm. Arabic? You know, you yeah. So all that to say, set aside, you look at the commentaries, like, uh, for instance, uh, any of them, Tabari, Qurtubi, Sayuti, uh, Zamakhshari, who focused on a lot of gra grammars and things like that, they always start by telling you, well, I mean, there are so many ways to read this word, and, and yeah. there is different opinions about this. I mean, even early Muslims struggle with things like this. Sometimes they even tell you, oh, this word could mean this according to people of Kufa. It could mean this according to people of Medina. It could mean this according to people of Sham or Levant. I mean, so early Muslims struggle with it. And Muslims today struggle with it. I mean, even though I was born and raised in Saudi and spoke uh, the Arabic in there and I have access to the Quran and I went even to university in Mecca, I assure you, no scholar in Islam over there will dare to tell you they understand the language of the Quran perfectly. Mm -hmm. uh, just wanted to address a, a quick comment here. Uh, Yusa Kuzgun said, the effort to try to misunderstand the Quran can be applied to Bible too. I dare you to apply same methodology on Bible and see how it can be misunderstood. Uh, Yusa, it doesn't make sense to apply this argument to the Bible because no one says the Bible can't be translated. No one says you can only understand the gospel exactly. in, in, the, in the original Greek. No one on the planet says that. The, 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 the reason that uh, the, uh, the Gospels were translated so rapidly into other languages is it was based on the idea that this is the message for all people. Do you see the difference here? So Jesus died on the cross for sins and rose from the dead, and now you need to submit to him as Lord. You can understand that in any language. Makes sense. You can translate the New Testament into any language on the planet. No Christian's going to say, oh, it only, oh, you're criticizing, you're questioning the deity of Christ. Well, you can't do that because it only, it only works in Greek, and you don't speak Greek. No Christian is going to pull that pathetic, cowardly stunt.
It's Muslim apologists and you guys who pull this stunt. And as soon as you say, oh, this is the religion for all people. And as soon as we start questioning something that it teaches, oh, whoa, 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 it only it only works in Arabic. It's a coward's move. But but what what's what's amazing here is we're going to get to the bottom of this now. And what we're going to find out is that what you guys claim, what you guys claim about the Quran actually totally, utterly, completely contradicts the Quran itself. And so, uh, so that's right. Al. That's right. And, and also, brother, I mean, think about it. I mean, um, uh, the Bible, the Old Testament was already translated into Greek. That's where we get the term Hellenistic uh, Jews who spoke mm -hmm. Greek, that the gospel was being written and shared with them in Greek. Why? Because God, in his wisdom, prepared the, the ground for the majority of people to hear the good news. It mm -hmm. won't be good news if you don't even understand it. Mm -hmm. That's right. And so, uh, yeah, so, uh, so my friends, but by the way, uh, uh, Al-Fadi, this, this is a common, this is a common problem where Muslims will use a completely bogus and stupid argument and then when we start pointing it out, they say, well, why don't you apply the same reasoning to your own? We, we don't use that, right? It's like, it's like- that's, that's the thing, exactly. Yeah, it's like perfect preservation right down to the letter. Muslims will say, the Quran's been perfectly preserved right down to the letter. And we start pointing out differences in the manuscripts. Oh, uh, out, yeah, entire chapters coming up missing, large pass, large, guess large what? passes. Yeah, I, I have some bad news, David. Tonight, yeah. I'll be doing my presentation, my PhD seminar tonight. And talk about that even the early scribes like Ibn Mas'ud, Ubay, even Ali ibn Abi Talib, you know, all of them have different ways of writing certain verses. The same mm -hmm. verse, it was written in different ways. And and I laugh when people tell me, oh, it was preserved in a preserved tablets. I mm -hmm. don't know what tablets were they, but they were fine tablets. That's for sure. Yeah. And uh, so... No, but what happens is Muslims will say the Quran has been perfectly preserved under the letter and we'll point to manuscripts and say, no, these manuscripts say different things. And then they'll say, well, so do you in the Bible. So why don't you apply the same reasoning to the Bible? We're not the ones who said it. You said that <laughs> you're the ones who said that, right? You're the ones who made that silly, ridiculous argument, not us. Right. So, uh, uh, yeah. So you've got this issue where Muslims will make a ridiculous argument that no, you, you know what it's like? Uh, 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 a couple of years ago, Muslims were sending around, literally millions of Muslims were claiming that a cat will not walk on the Quran, that a cat will always walk around the Quran. And guess it, what? It did walk, right? <laughs> yeah. I, it took me all of two seconds. I put a, I put a book down in front. I put a Quran down in front of the cat. Cat walked all over it, right? And then Muslims said, oh, well, no, since that has the translation, since it's parallel Arabic and English, it doesn't count as the Quran. I don't know where they're getting that from, but I said, fine. So then I did the exact same experiment with Arabic only Qurans. Again, cat walked all over it, right? So it's clear that some people had some 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 cats that they had trained not to walk on the Quran or or you, or you you record a bunch of footage of your cat and every time it walks around the Quran you keep that and every time it walks on the Quran you delete that footage. They did they did something cuz a cat will walk all over the Quran. Let's face it, cats don't care, right? So anyway, the the, the idea here is that's a stupid stupid thing to say. A cat will not walk on a, a cat will walk on any book. Cats do not care. Right. But Muslims are putting this out there. And as soon as I put the refutation out there and say, no, actually that's a lie. A cat will walk on the Quran. They say, well, why don't you try it on the Bible? Why would I try it on the Bible? No Christian in the history of humanity has ever said a cat will not walk on the Bible. What exactly. Is there, what exactly. is their So they, they really think that we use the same ridiculous arguments that they do when it's never crossed any Christian's mind to use these kind of arguments. For some reason, it's Islam that produces the most ridiculous, contrary to evidence arguments in the history of humanity, and they use this to prop up their religion. And they all, they all, they all love that. And that's a sad thing. Well, David, why don't you walk us through verse by verse where the argument about the Quran being revealed in Arabic is somehow this magnificent, uh, you know, evidence of its eloquency and its uh, the fact that it's a miraculous writing and so on and so forth. Yeah. So the the idea here is, if we ask our Muslim friends why the Quran was revealed. In Arabic, so we ask, right? Like, 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 of, of all the of all the languages in the world for Allah's final revelation, why this book? Why this language? Why not some other language that existed then? Why not a, a later language? Why? And Muslims will will give explanations like, oh, because Arabic is such a 
a rich language and can really can really get Allah's meaning across, which again, we, we've seen the problem here. You got people who are saying, you got Arabic scholars who are saying, we can't understand what in the world the Quran is saying. And then Muslims, as you pointed out, you can go to the commentaries and they'll say, oh, well, you know, based on this word, this could mean all kinds of different things and we can't figure out what in, the, what in the world this is saying. You can go to 10 different commentaries on one verse and get 10 different interpretations of the same verse. So exactly. you, ha you, have to want, you have to wonder if that's really a good answer. But, but what I wanna point out here is that is not the answer of the Quran. The Quran explains why it's revealed in Arabic. And it has it has nothing to do with any of that. Allah tells us why the Quran was revealed in Arabic. And the reason you never hear this from Muslims is that it completely contradicts what Muslims say about their book and why it was revealed in Arabic. And I would say completely destroys their entire religion. If you actually look at what this what this book says. So let's go. Let's go ahead and go without through. Without a doubt, brother. Without a doubt. I mean, I love it these days. I mean, uh, you know, brother. Uh, uh, Ten years ago, I would say, okay, I'll cut him some slack because we didn't have this boom in YouTube and social media platforms. That mm -hmm. today, if anyone brings the same dumb arguments, it's kind mm -hmm. of laughable. Honestly, I have no yeah. idea why they're still fixated on it. Yeah, and uh, well, I mean, it, really, it's going to be. They just have an amazing ability. And you'll see it in the comments, right? We'll go through all this. It'll be so simple that a four-year-old can understand it and they won't get it, right? Because they, they're they're trained to shut off their reasoning ability when Islam is criticized, right? Just like they're, they're trained to shut down the discussion once Islam is being criticized. They're trained to shut down the discussion by saying, oh, it only works in Arabic. They're trained to do that. And so they're just trained to shut everything down as soon as Islam is being criticized. And so once you've laid out a perfectly airtight argument and explained everything directly from the Quran to them, they still don't get it. And they'll still run out and just keep saying the same thing over and over again. This is why Jesus, when he would speak, he would say, uh, those who have ears to hear, let them hear, right? Like if you are actually capable of understanding these truths right now, because he understood some people are just closed, are just closing themselves off. All right, so let's go through some Quran verses. So in, uh, so, so as you know, according to the Quran, Allah sent prophets to every nation, That's right? right. It, it wasn't just Israel. It wasn't just Israel and then, uh, and then Arabia. It was everyone. So let's go ahead and read some passages here. Surah 16, verse 36 of the Quran, Allah says, and certainly we have raised in every nation an apostle saying, serve Allah and shun false gods. Every nation. So an apostle was sent to every nation to guide people to the truth. And you have uh, many other Quran verses on this issue. It will say that uh, Allah uh, established the, the sacrificial system for people in, in, in different countries and so on. So Allah sent a sent a prophet to every nation. Well, what happened with the Arabs then? Because Muhammad supposed to, supposedly the first uh, the first prophet messenger to come to the Arabs. Well, basically the Arabs were last. Everyone else had their prophet. Everyone else had their messenger. Uh, but Allah came to the Arabs last. So oh, uh, wait, 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 uh, David. I thought Abraham and Ishmael came to the Arabs. What happened to that? Well, that that is that is an issue. I'm gonna I'm about to release an issue on that, asking Muslims to solve this little problem. If Muhammad is is said to be the one who came to the Arabs and they had no messenger uh, who would come to them before, then how do you explain? Um, Abraham and Ishmael supposedly coming to them, building the Kaaba. So uh, all a Muslim could say here is, well, maybe they came and then built it and left. But wait a minute, Muslims still follow the same the same practices with the Hajj that the pagans were following, right? That you know, uh, running between right. the, yeah, running between the hills of you know Safa and Marwa and uh, 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 walking walking around the Kaaba over and over again. They're still doing all of the same practices. So that must mean that that. Abraham and Ishmael actually established the proper worship of God. You could say it was corrupted over time, but they must have stayed there and established and, and showed people how to worship. Because for, for some reason, by the time you get to the seventh century AD, they're still worshiping properly because Muhammad keeps all of those practices. Exactly. So, and uh, so, because they have the tension on their uh, on them right now to prove, because if Ishmael was the, was the father of Arabs, then... How, mm -hmm. how come he wasn't a prophet for them? And if they say, well, they weren't speaking Arabic, wait a minute, the Quran says that they speak Arabic, right? Because they were speaking Arabic in the Quran. I'm using yep. their argument. 
Yep. So, uh, so yeah, there, 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 there is, there is that issue. So Muslims have to do something with that. I'll let them decide how they're going to solve that problem. But the Quran also says that Muhammad was the the one who came to the Arabs, to the people who had no uh, no prophet before him. So, um, and by the way, the the only way I could even imagine them making them responding here is to say what it means is someone who come actually comes from that area, right? Not someone who travels to that area like Abraham and Ishmael, but someone who actually springs up doesn't say that, but I'm assuming that that would be the the reconciliation, but that's not gonna that's not gonna help them. So uh Surah 30 Surah 36 verses two through six, Allah declares, I swear by the Quran full of wisdom, most surely you, O Muhammad, are of the apostles on a right way, a revelation of the mighty, the merciful, that you may warn a people whose fathers were not warned, so they are heedless. Muhammad is going to warn people who had not been, their their, their ancestors had not been warned That's yet. Right. That's so right. he's the one that comes to them. So Arabs hadn't been warned. Um, Surah 34 to, uh, Surah 34 verses 43 to 44. And when our clear communications are recited to them, they say, this is not but a man who desires to turn you away from that which your fathers worshipped. And they say, this is not but a lie that is forged. And those who disbelieve say of the truth when it comes to them, this is only clear enchantment. And we have not given them any books which they read, nor did we send to them before you a warner. Now notice, uh, Allah sounds pretty clear here. He says, we have not given them any books which they should read, nor did we send to them before you a warner. So the Arabs didn't have a warner before Muhammad. Yeah, so, and I want to I want to comment here, uh, David. I think in a video that you did, the short video, uh, you brought it up. Also, it seemed like the Quran and Allah and Muhammad always contradict what the Muslims want to tell you. Always, yeah. mm -hmm. always, always, really, really, always. <laughs> and it's uh, it's almost sad because I mean, really, is Islam Islam is no longer the religion of submission to Allah. You can read, I can I can show you 50 verses from the Quran that Muslims would reject in a heartbeat. Uh, Islam is now the religion of submission to Muslim leaders who completely contradict the exactly. Quran. And when, exactly. you tell, when you tell Muslims what your Muslim leader is telling you completely contradicts what your God and your prophet say, they say, you're a liar because my leader doesn't say that. So they just mindlessly agree with, with what their leader says, even if he's completely contradicting the Quran. All right, so there's no warner before Muhammad. Still have to still have to wonder about uh, um, Ishmael and Abraham. But Surah 32, verse 3. Or do they say he has forged it? Nay, it is the truth from your Lord that you, O Muhammad, may warn a people to whom no warner has come before you that they may follow the right direction. So a prophet, notice, a prophet had been Very sent. Clear. Yeah, a prophet had been sent to every nation but no prophet had come to the Arabs. And this is why Allah sent Muhammad. He specifically says, I'm sending you to a people who had no warner. Every other nation had a warner except this one. No warner had come to this people. That's why you need to go and give them uh, give them an understanding of the religion to get them out of this, uh, out of this pagan nonsense. Um, once right. Muhammad had been sent to the Arabs, every nation had been warned. So we read in Surah 35, verse 24, surely we have sent you, Muhammad, with the truth as a bearer of good news and a warner, and there is not a people, but a warner has gone among them. So now, Muhammad, now that I've sent you, now there is no place. There is no place on earth where a warner has not gone forward. Now notice. Exactly. If, exactly. If, yeah. If So if, if Muhammad was the first one, the first warner to come to these people, and now that Muhammad has come, now every nation has already had its warner, then this means that Muhammad was just last in line. And this is the reason that he's the seal of the prophets. He's the seal of the prophets because he's just last in line, right? Every other, now every place at it, Muhammad's last. Now everyone has their prophet. Everyone has their revelation from God. And now, you know, we'll see what happens, right? All That's right. right. That's right. Now, um, if you if you if you read the Quran, it really really sounds. It really emphasizes that Muhammad is sent to the Arabs so that they could have a revelation in their language. So Surah forty two verse seven um, says that the Quran was revealed in Arabic to warn the Arabs who lived in and around Mecca. So Allah says, and thus 
have we revealed to you an Arabic Quran that you may warn the mother city, Muslims say this is Mecca, that you may warn the mother city and those around it, and that you may give warning of the day of gathering together, wherein is no doubt a party shall be in the garden and another party in the burning fire. So he specifically says, hey, we sent yeah. you here so that you can warn Mecca and the places around it. Exactly. Well, and, and, and this one is, is interesting, by the way, because geographically speaking, it narrowed it down just to Mecca and the surrounding villages or cities. That's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the mission of Muhammad. Yeah. And uh, what, what's interesting is so, so here, what, what a Muslim can say is, uh, yes, but that's it first. So at first, he has to warn those people. And then his, his mission is, is going to is going to grow, but there Muslims would be contradicting their own methodology because when Jesus says that he came for the lost sheep of Israel, no when, kidding. Yeah, they say, oh, if he said that, then he can never expand that. When in the exactly. same in the same book, Jesus tells his followers to go into all the world, right, and make I disciples know, of, of of all nations. All right. So um, now think about this for a moment. So there were Jews and Christians in Arabia. The Arabs. Why did the Arabs need a revelation in their own language? I mean, the Arabs could have gone, according to the Quran, the Quran approves the inspiration and the preservation and the authority of the Jewish and Christian scriptures. Uh, the Quran nowhere claims that our scriptures have been corrupted. The Quran says that uh, Allah says that he inspired our books. That's Surah 3, verses 3 to 4, says he inspired the Torah and the gospel. Uh, Muslims want to say, yeah, but then it was corrupted. Well, Allah says, Surah 18, verse 27, Surah 6, verse 115, no one can change his words. Exactly. So Muslims are calling Allah a liar. Oh, but my leader said that that Allah's words have been changed. Allah says no one can change his words. But my leader says his words can be changed. But Allah says no one can change his words. But my leader says, and they just believe whatever they're, they're You know why they go to the leader? Speaking what? of the topic, because they don't understand the Arabic. They have to go mm -hmm. to somebody who claims to know the Arabic. Yeah. Sadly. It's, it's very, very sad. Um, so uh, Allah says that Allah says that we still had the Torah and the gospel in the seventh century. We know what the Torah and the gospel said during the seventh century because we have copies before and after that time. Um, Allah the, the, in in Surah five verse forty three of the Quran, the Jews come to Muhammad to settle a dispute, and Allah Allah says to Muhammad, "Why are they coming to you when they have the Torah?" Exactly. And and the we know the historical background for, from that because we have it in Sunan Abu Dawud uh, 4434, where the Jews come to Muhammad and he says, Bring me the Torah. And they put him on this judgment cushion, which was this you know symbol symbol that you're the judge. You sit on this special cushion, and uh, they bring out the Torah, and Muhammad gets off the cushion, puts the uh, Torah, puts the Torah on it, exactly the Torah on it, and says, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you. So exactly. Muhammad, so so notice what Muhammad is saying. I'm not your judge. The Torah is your judge. Put the Torah on the judgment seat. I'm not the judge here. Allah says, Allah says you don't need me because you have the Torah. Now notice that makes no sense if the the Muslim view is correct, right? What do Muslims believe today? Uh, yeah, I'm corrupt. God sent the Torah, but he couldn't protect it, even though he says no one can change his words. He couldn't protect it, and so the Jews corrupted it. Then he revealed the gospel, and he couldn't protect that either. Even though he says no one can change his words, they changed his words anyway. And then he revealed the Torah to cover up all the, all the corruption and to give them a true revelation. Well, if that Muslim view is correct, then the Jews would need Muhammad to correct their, to correct their corruptions. But exactly. that's the opposite of what Allah says. He says they don't need you, Muhammad. They got the Torah. Then just that's a few... Right. Just a few verses later, he says the same thing about the gospel. He says, let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah hath revealed therein. He doesn't say, people of the gospel, you need to go to the Quran. He says, you judge by the gospel. That makes and no sense if the gospel has been corrupted. And a few verses later, remember, he challenged them that you got nothing to stand on. Yep, that's yeah. Chapter 5, verse 68. You, uh, yeah. People of the book, you have no ground to stand upon unless you stand fast by the Torah, the gospel, and all the revelation that has come to you. It makes no you sense if our revelations are corrupt. You know, David, are you still doing your boom, boom room? Because we missed that. Uh, so I'm thinking if Muhammad today appears back from the dead and challenges the Muslim thinking, they're going to put him to death, actually. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that'd be funny. Yeah, we'll do something like that. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, so they've, they've, they, they're completely contradicting themselves on this issue. But notice, because... There you have it. You have this complete contradiction between what Muslims say and what Allah says. What Allah says is, guys, the Christians, they have their revelation. They need to go to their revelation. They have true, reliable revelation. They need to go to it. 
Allah tells the Jews, the Jews have reliable, uncorrupted revelation. They need to judge by that. Well, what what's the Quran for then? It's for Arabs who couldn't speak that language. Now notice, notice, here's the issue. If Allah is still telling Jews to judge by the Torah, and he's still telling Christians to judge by the gospel, why doesn't he just tell the Arabs to judge by the Torah or by the gospel? Why doesn't he say, go judge by their books? They've still got reliable scripture. He doesn't tell them that because they need a revelation in their own language, not something that's in Hebrew, not something that's in Greek. They need something in their own language. And notice, he can't expect them to just believe what they say because he repeatedly says in the Quran, they change the meaning with their tongues. They and alter the meaning. Is orally, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So notice, you can't just trust what a Jew says or what a Christian says because if you can't read it for yourself, they might be misrepresenting it. But, but think about this. Think about this. Think about this, brother. If that's the if the point here is that they need a revelation in their own language because you can't just trust what someone says about their about their book. You can't just trust them. You need to be able to read it for yourself. Notice how this is completely contradicting what Muslims believe about the Quran. They believe that we all just have to believe what they say about I'm about the yeah about the about the Quran or. We can spend years of our lives learning this other language and trying to understand it. But notice that's exactly what Allah is saying. The Arabs can't be expected to do. I can't expect these Arabs to just blindly trust what these other people with their books are saying in other languages. And I can't expect these Arabs to all run out and learn Greek and Hebrew. Most people don't have the time to do that. But that's what, so he, he's saying I need, they need a revelation in their language so that they can understand it in their own language, not be expected to go and just blindly trust what people are saying, not be expected to go out and learn all these other languages. I, they need something in their own language, but what are Muslims telling us? Well, we have to just believe what they say about their language, or we all have to spend our lives learning this other language. Exactly what the Quran says it was revealed for is... <laughs> I know. Exactly what the Quran is supposed to avoid is what Muslims are saying we're, 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 we're all, we all have to do now. It's amazing. And also, I mean, David, I mean, even in the Sirah, in a biography of Muhammad, didn't teach that Muhammad would go to Waraka ibn Nawfal, the cousin mm -hmm. of his first wife, that he would translate to him in, into Arabic from the Greek and the Hebrew? Mm -hmm. Why was that okay? If the mm -hmm. Bible was corrupt, why would he learn in a corrupt Bible then? Yep. Yeah, no, it, it makes no sense. Muhammad said that, that Jews and Christians still had the Torah and the gospel. Um, and so there, there's there's just no way around this for, for Muslims. Now, um, if you if you so if you look at what the Quran actually says about why it's come, it's doing something specifically in Arabic. So Surah 46, verse 12. And before this, the Quran, before this Quran was the book of Moses as a guide and a mercy. And this book, the Quran, confirms it, the Torah, in the Arabic language to admonish the unjust and as glad tidings to those who do right. So before we had the Torah, but we need it confirmed in the Arabic language for Arabs so that they can understand it. Exactly. And here's here's uh, here's probably one of the last passages we'll need to go to, but this one is very, very, very important because this passage, once you understand it in the light of everything else we've just looked at, just destroys and obliterates the Muslim position and makes it completely incoherent. Um, according to the Quran, if Allah hadn't given a revelation in Arabic, the Arabs would have had an excuse on the day of judgment. They would have been able to say, Everyone else had the revelation except us. That's not fair. How do you how do you, how do you even know? We we might we we would have served God better than all these people if we had a revelation in our own language, but you didn't give us a revelation. We're the only people in the world who don't get a revelation. Watch what the Quran says. Surah 6 right. verses 155 to 157. And this Quran is a book we have revealed as a blessing. Therefore follow it and guard against evil that mercy may be shown to you lest you should say so the Quran is revealed as a blessing in what? In, in Arabic. Why? Lest you should say the book was revealed to only two parties before us. And we were truly unaware of what they read, right? Uh, we didn't speak their language. Well, we were unaware of what they read. Or lest you should say, if the book had been revealed to us, we would certainly have been better guided than they. So if Allah doesn't give the Arabs 
a revelation in their own language, then they'll, they'll have an excuse on the day of judgment. We didn't have a revelation in our language. We didn't have something that speaks to us in our language. We can't be, we can't be expected to just trust what people say because people yeah. misrepresent the truth all the time. And you can't expect us to go out and learn all these other languages. Most people don't have time for that. Therefore, every group needs a revelation in their own language. This is why Allah says, the Jews, you have your book. You judge by your book. Christians, you have your book. You judge by your book. And now Muslims, the Arab-speaking Muslim, Arabic speaking Muslims, they have their book. They judge by that book in their language. So here, uh, here again, the, the entire reason, according to the Quran, the reason that the Quran is revealed in Arabic is just because the Arabs were the last people to get their revelation and they needed a revelation in their language so that they could understand it in their language and not have to mindlessly trust what people say about it because exactly. the people say exactly. because people might be lying and so that they don't have to go out and learn all kinds of other languages why is this important the entire basis for giving the Quran in Arabic completely contradicts what Muslims say about their book today. They say that Allah gave it in Arabic so that now everyone has to either trust what Arabs say about the book, or we can all spend years of our lives trying to learn Arabic. It's the complete opposite of what the Quran says about why it's revealed. Do the Muslims here? Do they even care? No, because that's not what my leader said. My leader said that Allah gave it because all previous revelations have been corrupted. Well, does it bother you at all that your God completely contradicts that? No, I don't care because my leader said it. Well, does it bother you that you, your, your prophet completely contradicts that? No, I don't care because that's what my, my leader didn't say that. My parents didn't say that. All I care about is what my leader and my parents say. Who cares what my God and prophet say? This is the religion of submission to my and Muslim leaders. And here is my advertisement. Next time you need to come to Imam David Wood and Imam Al Fadi. We will help you tremendously. We'll now, here, here is another thing that is interesting about uh, chapter 6, verse 156, David. It's the same Arabs who supposedly became Muslims. They were complaining that two groups before them got one book singular. Doesn't this? Co coincide with what we have don't we have one book we call it the bible the holy bible that has the torah the old testament the, the hebrew stuff and it yeah. has the Injil and the new testament and the greek stuff yeah. well if if that was corrupt why are they whining and, and and saying we need a book like that if there was corrupt book yeah and uh and i mean j just the quran the, the quran always refers to christians and jews as the people of the book right the people of the book it understands that we have a we have a bible right um, it'll say that that the Christians will say, you know, the Christians will say the Jews are wrong and the Jews will say the Christians are wrong and it said, and yet they both read the book. Right. So it's talking it's talking about this. It's talking about these different revelations, the Torah, the gospel, the Psalms. But it also understands that we just have a book. And so you just wonder how Muslims can get all of this wrong when the few things that the Quran gets right, the Muslims contradict. So the Quran only gets a few things right. And when it gets something right the muslims say the opposite of what it says so this is some this is some amazing stuff here it is indeed brother and and it's just a, it's mind boggling obviously i mean i can relate to their argument because i used to use it myself i mean i i grew up believing in it with wholeheartedly i believe the bible was corrupt ask me why was it corrupt who corrupted it when was it i have no clue somebody mm -hmm. told me that's an authority i believe it moving on you know and that's what got me into trouble when i start to challenge christians and i say oh your book is corrupt and they would look at me like what planet are you living on i mean mm -hmm. uh, so show us show us wh why you believe in this and i didn't have a single argument to refute the mountain of evidence that they presented to me yeah and uh, that's important to keep in mind because uh even though muslims will say ah oh, well you know bart ehrman they've never read bart ehrman they don't know what bart ehrman says bart ehrman agrees with us way more than he agrees with uh muslims um but uh the the the, the idea that the gospel has been corrupted that the torah has been corrupted has absolutely nothing with nothing to do with Muslims looking at manuscripts and saying, oh, the, the manuscripts have changed or something like that. It has nothing to do with that. It only has the it only has something to do with them knowing that Allah affirmed that he gave revelations, the Torah and the gospel, and then eventually realizing, wait a minute, the Torah and the gospel don't line up with the Quran, right? So Allah says, hey, I revealed the Torah and the gospel, and the Jews have a book and the Christians have a book, and I, I revealed that book. 
Well, eventually, eventually the Muslim community starts looking at all these books and Jews and Christians are pointing out, your, your book doesn't line up with ours. Your book completely contradicts ours on basic doctrines. That, they don't line up. That's right. But now notice the obvious, obvious, obvious conclusion to draw at that point should have been, wow, Muhammad didn't know what he's talking about. Allah didn't know what he's talking about. The Quran cannot possibly be the word of God if it just affirmed as the inspired word of God books that completely contradict Islam. Because once you once you once you go to those books and you realize there are only two possibilities: either Christians and Jews have the inspired word of God, or we don't have the inspired word of God. If we have the inspired word of God, Islam is false because it contradicts our books. If we don't have the inspired word of God, Islam is false because Islam says we have the inspired word of God. So either way, Islam has to be false. Islam has to be false either way. That's the obvious conclusion to draw. Once your prophet keeps telling you, go to the books of the Jews and Christians, they have reliable scripture, and you go there and it completely contradicts Islam. But by the time the Muslims were realizing that, you couldn't say you couldn't say Muhammad was wrong. You get your head chopped off. No You're, kidding. You beheaded. Especially yeah. that, that verse that you refer to right now, chapter 10, verse 94, it was talking in a singular to Muhammad to go to the people of the book if he is in doubt. What do Muslims tell you today, David? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's talking just about the Muslims. Muhammad never doubted. Yeah, that's total nonsense. And notice, even in the verse you're talking about, so so uh, everyone, you can look this verse up, Surah 10, verse 94 of the Quran. Surah 10, verse 94. Allah says to Muhammad, if you are in doubt as to what we have revealed to you, ask those who read the book before you, so the people of the book. So Muhammad's having doubts. Keep in mind, Muhammad had uh, various doubts throughout his life. I mean, his first impression of his you revelations, think? yeah, his first impression of his revelations was that they were demonic. He had to be talked out of that view by his wife, uh, who wasn't there, who had no idea what he encountered, but he had to be talked out of that. But in Surah 10, verse 94, Allah says to Muhammad, if you are in doubt as to what we have revealed to you, ask those who read the book before you. So Muhammad is sent to Jews and Christians, the people of the book, to make sure that his revelations line up with our revelations. And that's the only way he could confirm that his revelations were actually from God. So notice, Muslims Muslims believe that you've got the Quran and the Quran is standing in judgment over the Bible. And if the Bible doesn't line up with the Quran, well, so much for the Bible, the Bible's been corrupted. When in, according to the Quran, it's actually reversed the Torah and the gospel stand in judgment over the Quran. And if the Quran does not match up, we would know that Muhammad is a false prophet. That's according to Allah himself. Muhammad, you can know that I'm giving you the true revelations by making sure your revelations line up with the Bible. Exactly. With the Bible. <laughs> and and why, why doesn't that, why wouldn't that still apply? If that's the only way we can know Muhammad's revelations are true, if they line up with our revelations, well, they don't line up with our revelations. Therefore, too bad. Muhammad was correct for doubting his revelations because he's a false prophet. And you know, brother, I mean, you see progressive, basically, reinterpretation of things. But if you look at Muhammad alone, his doubt, he started doubting. Midway, he was doubting. Later on, he was doubting. Chapter 46, for instance, verse 9, that I don't know what's going to happen to me or to you. I mean, yep. he's always been doubting. And at the end, he asked people to pray for his forgiveness, that God will grant him this high place in heaven. Why in the world would you ask people to pray for you if you're not even going there? Mm -hmm. It's obvious that, uh, you know, Muhammad, really, he gave people many signs that he's not so sure about himself that yeah, to yeah. be a prophet. Yeah, uh, it was definitely, definitely shaky. But uh, but but notice here, here again, that verse, Surah 10, verse 94, makes no sense if the Torah and the gospel have been corrupted. If, if the Torah and the gospel exactly. have been corrupted... Why would Allah say, you can know that you're, you've got the word of God by making sure it lines up with the Bible? It doesn't make any sense. So what you have here is all these different groups, they've received their prophets. Uh, certain groups have, rece have received actual books. And the people who have those books have to judge by those books. And now Muhammad has come. He's given a revelation to the Arabs in Arabic. And now different groups have their revelations. And they all have to judge by the revelations in their own language. Well, what do we need the Quran for? We don't need the Quran. We don't need the Quran at all. Arabs need the Quran, according to the Quran. What do Muslims tell us today? Nope. Everyone has to drop their own revelations. The revelations are all corrupt, even though the Quran says they're not. Uh, but the revelations are all corrupt. And now everyone either has to just blindly trust some random Muslim, and you don't know if he's telling you the truth or not, or you have to go out and spend the next 10 years of your life learning Arabic so that you can understand this mess of a book that you won't even be able to understand when you learn Arabic. 
Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly, brother, and, and and that's really the sad reality. And it's uh, something special also about, uh, I mean, damaging, uh, special in terms of being damaged. And chapter five of the Quran is considered traditionally to be among the last two yeah. chapters to be revealed. I mean, so if up until the end of the life of the Prophet of Islam, he's still convinced that the Bible that we have, that mm -hmm. he had in his days, are still okay for the Jews and the Christians to go to. So I don't know where in the world do Muslims come up with any justification that Muhammad lied and the Quran lied. Yeah, they're, they're, the, the, their only justification is that's what my leaders said, right? That's what, that's what my leaders told me. They said it's been corrupt, so it's been corrupt. Why doesn't Allah ever actually say it's been corrupt? Um, you got a problem. Why does Allah only affirm the inspiration, preservation, authority of our scriptures if he's really trying to say that uh, it's been corrupt? So what they're left with at the end of the day is Allah just couldn't say what he means. He's the worst communicator in all of history, despite the fact that he brags throughout the Quran that he's the most clear speaker ever. Um, he's not clear. And even though Muhammad, according to Islam, is the greatest interpreter of the Quran, and he affirmed that Jews and Christians still had the Torah and the gospel in a reliable, preserved form, um, he just couldn't say what he actually meant, and he must have been misled by Allah, who's the worst communicator ever. Right. And so that's why we need our modern Muslim imams to come tell us the truth, and our parents. And they can tell us because they're way better communicators than Allah. Well, I, actually, uh, I agree. They are massively better communicators than Allah, which, but now you've got the problem here. If Allah brags constantly about being so incredibly clear, and yet even Muslims are telling us he's the worst communicator ever, then he's just wrong in what he says. If he's, wrong, if he's wrong about his ability to communicate, if he's wrong about the status of the Torah, if he's wrong about the status of the gospel, if he's wrong about the scriptures that Jews and Christians, if he's wrong about all these things, wh why do you believe it? Why are you trusting this guy to get you to heaven? Why are you trusting him to tell you the truth, right? It's like Muslims say, here, our God and our prophet are wrong about everything you can actually check out, but believe them anyway. It's amazing. What an amazing religion, man. It is indeed. And, and you know, one of the things, you know, David, that, uh, you know, you and I did recently a, um, a remember, a, a couple of series, video series, and I want to bring it up to the attention of people. It was just about maybe a month and a half ago that me and David were at the studios and uh, we did a series about atheism and Islam. Now, some of you will say, well, wh what does this have anything to do with that? Well, because of things like this that we're talking about right now, there are many young Muslims now who are disenfranchised, uh, disillusioned about Islam, and they're gravitating towards just the idea of becoming an atheist. And David, if you want to elaborate a little bit further on what we did, just as a teaser, because we'll be releasing it soon here. Yeah, well, we went through, uh, we went through a number of uh, standard arguments against Islam, which Christians and and Muslims, I mean, Christians and atheists would usually agree on. Christians and atheists would usually say, yep, that, that is, that's a problem for Islam. But we show that there's no real basis in atheism for saying that that sort of thing is wrong. And so we kind of pointed out parallel problems for atheism and Islam. Islam has the problem because they're propping up Muhammad as this great moral example when he did all these horrible things. Atheism has a parallel problem because how do you con what, on what basis do you condemn those things, right? Are, are you saying it's just your, your, per your personal feelings? Are you saying it goes against society? What are you saying it goes against? Exactly. And and that's why, you know, some of the youngsters now, because they're tired of going and asking questions all the time of, uh, of their leaders, uh, they're deciding to take the shortcut and just leave Islam altogether, assuming that Christianity also is revealed by the same God of Islam. And obviously, it's very clear here that that's not the case. Uh, the God right. of the Bible has nothing whatsoever to do with the God of the Quran. Mm -hmm. Absolutely nothing. Uh, can I wreck a comment real quick? Oh, yeah, please. I mean, uh, uh, we can take a so look here at we, the comments here. Here, yeah. here, we, here we have uh, someone who goes by the name Ultimate Truth. He's yep. not a... He's not a narcissist at all, He, but he's the ultimate truth. Uh, he says, Acts 17 apologetics. Do you need Allah to tell you the Bible is corrupted? Um, do you need Allah to tell you the Bible is corrupted? And then he gives examples. Mark 16, Trinity, Ascension, 66 books, uh, 66 or 73 books. You are a joke. The world knows your Biblos is not trustworthy at Sierra International Notice. If we granted everything that ultimate truth just said, all we could conclude from that is that Allah and Muhammad had no clue what they were talking about. The Quran is a false book because the Quran affirms the inspiration and the preservation and the authority of 
the Torah and the gospel. He says, no one can change his words. And so if you're saying that our books have been corrupted, you've just called your God a liar and your book a lie. Yeah. So, so that's, yeah. So that's one thing. Uh, you said, do you need Allah to tell you the Bible is corrupted? No, but Allah says my book's not corrupted. So that's the point, right? The point is whatever the status of my book is, your God's, your God's got it wrong. So your religion is false no matter what the status of my book is. Now, are these things you pointed out a problem? He points out Mark 16. Now, Mark 16, you have basically uh, some manuscripts end with uh, uh, Mark 16, verse, 9, 16 verse 9. Yeah, verse 8, and then you have the, the longer ending, verses 9 through 20. So he says that this is a problem. Now, now watch, because uh, here in a moment he says 66 or 73 books. And there he's referring to the idea that even though Catholics have the same Old Testament and the same New Testament, and then you they, have it in between. Yeah, they include some what are called intertestament, uh, intertestamental or uh, deuterocanonical books, which they didn't they didn't include as a, as authoritative or semi authoritative until the 1500s, right? So for 1500 years, Christian Protestants, Catholics have uh, are following the same text, and the 1500s. The Catholics realized they 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 need these extra books to defend uh, certain doctrines, so um, so they included them in there. Notice no difference on New Testament, right? That those 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 are those extra books. No difference on Old Testament. No difference on New Testament. It's the ones in between. So exactly. notice a Muslim is going to say, "Aha! You see, therefore you you you've got a corruption there. You've got a corruption." Now notice notice here, right? Wait a minute. If you have a dispute about the ending of Mark, and you have disputes about the number of books. Your book has been corrupted, and he he takes it as he takes it as as a fact that the Bible's been corrupted because of these things. Well, what would happen if he's consistent? Al Fadi, you know this. Ibn Masud, Muhammad's top reciter of the Quran. Muhammad said, "If you want to learn the Quran from anyone, learn it from Ibn Masud." Exactly. Ibn Masud had a hundred and eleven chapters in his Quran. And, and uh, please, please tell him why. I mean, because I know why. Yeah. Tell him. Yeah. Ibn Masood said, look, Surah, Surah 1, Surah 113, and Surah 114, these are not the Quran. This is not Allah speaking to us. These are prayers that we pray. This is, us, ta exactly. this is us talking to God, not God talking to us. These aren't supposed to be in the Quran. So Ibn Masood, so notice Muslims have another dilemma here, right? Uh, either Muhammad knows what he's talking about or he doesn't know what he's talking about. If Muhammad knows what he's talking about, and he says, go to Ibn Masud to learn the Quran, then the Quran they have today has three extra chapters in it. It's been corrupted. Or if Muhammad, if they want to say Muhammad doesn't know what he's talking about, then great. Your prophet doesn't know what he's talking about. He doesn't know what he doesn't know what's in this, he doesn't know what's supposed to be in the Quran. So he doesn't know who to point to to confirm the Quran or to, to tell you where to go to get to, to get the right Quran. So notice you have Ibn Masud, he has 111 chapters. Uh, the Quran Zayd ibn Thabit came up with had 114. That's that's the the ancestor of the Quran that Muslims and then use today. Ibn Kab. He has 116. He has two additional chapters. So, and these were two additional prayers, right? So, oh, yeah. so Ubay believes no. Keep there are five prayers that we pray. We want all of those in there. And Ibn Masud, he's saying no. Those prayers don't go in there. That's us talking to God, not God talking to us. And then uh, Zayd ibn Thabit, he's like the compromiser. I'll, 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 I'll keep three of them, but not those two. Yeah. Average. <laughs> so, so think about. But notice, uh, notice. Protestants and Catholics have a disagreement that arises in the fifteen in the fifteen hundreds, so fifteen centuries after the, after they had this, and it's not about the contents of the New Testament. It's not about the contents of the Old Testament. It's not about either of those things. So those things aren't in dispute. And ultimate truth here says, you see, that's corruption. You see, that's what I mean by corrupted. Okay, well, if that's what you mean by corrupted, when we're talking about the disputes over which chapters are supposed to be in the Quran, that's not a dis that's not a dispute that came centuries after Islam, that's for that's there from the very beginning no kidding and where where was what is Allah about uh, about the ending of mark did he fail to mention something about that I no mean, no now notice you have those differences in the manuscripts you have those differences in the manuscripts long before the time of Muhammad and yet Muhammad and Allah are affirming the scriptures of exactly. the Christians. they're, they're exactly. affirming it so Allah has no problem with it if a Muslim has a problem with it he's saying he knows more than Allah and more than his prophet but but notice here so we, we have that we have that that dispute early on you have Abu Musa you have Abu Musa in Sahih Muslim 2286 saying that they they forgot two entire chapters of the Quran now we're not talking about a little ending part here we're talking about two entire chapters right oh my. I, Aisha you, said a uh, goat ate it also yeah, yeah you've got you, you you you've got that you've got that's Sunan Ibn Majah Sunan Ibn Majah says that uh in Sunan Ibn Majah Aisha says that she had the only copy of certain verses and her sheep came in and ate it 
And now those verses aren't in the Quran anymore. She said those verses were in the Quran at the time of Muhammad's death. Holy right? God, so you, what, what business do you have changing the Quran after Muhammad dies? Well, the sheep ate it. So they have to believe that the sheep was sent by Allah because he wanted to change the Quran. Not only that, Aisha says that two-thirds two -thirds of Surah 33 was lost. Over 100 verses of Surah 33 were lost. They were lost. And those are some of the verses that were lost in battle when the only people who had them memorized died in battle. So over 100 verses from just one chapter. So notice, if we take ultimate truth seriously, so this is what he means by corruption. Do you know? Do you need a law to tell you the Bible is corrupted? I'll prove to you that it's been corrupted. This is his idea. Mark 16. So you have a disagreement about the ending. And you have later 66 or 73 books. Okay, so, well, wait a minute. If that's what you mean by corrupted, then the Quran's been corrupted. So that's not what we mean by corrupted, right? When we're talking about corrupted, we mean like you're, 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 there's something there's something that would corrupt your, your doctrines, right? And by the way, you, notice, notice Al-Fadi. When we talk about Mark 16, how do we know that there's that there's a difference there? Because we keep our manuscripts and we compare our manuscripts and we can actually line them up. We have we have this field called textual criticism. Exactly, David. How did he know anything about yeah. the end of Mark yeah. if it wasn't for our Bible telling him that? Yeah, you can spot these things. How do we know? Oh, 66 or 73. We know we know when the Catholic Church <laughs> voted on this issue. We have our history, we can examine our manuscripts, we know it because we preserve our manuscripts and we don't try to cover up the evidence. How is this different in Islam? When they have differences, we know it. We know what happened. This is Sahih al-Bukhari. When, when people came to Uthman and said, we have all these differences and we're, we're going to go to war over this, over all these differences in the Quran. He says, everyone send in the Quran. We're burning all of them. He burned all the Qurans and then put out his official version, which Ibn Masud rejected, which Ubay ibn Qad rejected. Why is this relevant? Well, th those are two of the people Muhammad said, go to if you want to learn the Quran. And they were both, they were both, they were both wrong, according to Zayd ibn Thabit. And, and this, this, was so, this was so severe that Ibn Masud called the Quran that Zayd was putting out a deceit. He said the people are guilty of deceit. And he told his followers, hide your Qurans. Don't hand them over to these guys. They're just going to burn them. Keep them. Hide them. This doesn't right. make sense if the Quran's been perfectly preserved. So thanks, ultimate truth. Your book's been corrupted, but your God says ours hasn't. Amen. And, and you know what? I agree with uh, the point you brought about uh, uh, Ibn Masoud because tonight, like I said, I am going to prove from Ibn Masoud's own readings that mm -hmm. the Quran we have today, the so-called Uthmanic standardized Quran, does not match with the early Quran. Doesn't. So uh, how can we, I mean, Uthman wasn't even involved in being a scribe or writing anything down or even given an authority by Muhammad, he decided, guess what, to collect it and burn other copies. Mm -hmm. Later, mm -hmm. another guy, the Al-Hajjaj, decided to fix things and destroy others. Later, the 1924 Cairo edition, guess what? They did their own copy and sank the rest in the Nile River. I mean, mm -hmm. is there a trend here? Oh, yeah. And uh, just, so, just so you know, um, I know a, a Quran scholar. And I pointed out to him, I said, you know, if because uh, uh, this goes back to, this was me and Nabil, I'm talking like probably 2008. So this was a long time ago. Nabil and I were talking and we're like, you know what we really need in English? We need Ibn Abi Dawood's Kitab al-Masahif, right? Exactly. That, that's, that, that, that's his work. This is the son of the great Hadith collector, Abu Dawood. And he collected narrations about all the differences in the Quran and all the disputes over the Quran and all the changes to the and Quran. He Asahif, plur, plural, yep. mm -hmm. not one. Mm -hmm. Asahif, Quran. Yep. yep. And yeah. so uh, I was talking to a, uh, a, uh, a Quran scholar, I'm actually a Quran manuscript scholar. And I said, I, uh, I know him. <laughs> yeah. And I said, oh, yeah, you do. And I said, uh, I said, hey, if, 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 if I could come up with the funds to actually fund it through like a go fund me, you think we could actually get the people who could come out with an authoritative translation of that to make available for all the people. And I said, yeah, I think we could get that done. So uh, yeah, one, of the, yeah. one of the, one of the, one of these days I'll put the word out. I'll put the plan out. And we'll have to figure out exactly what it's going to cost and so on, but whatever it's going to cost, we're going to get it out there. And my goodness, Muslims are told all their lives by their leaders, perfect preservation right down to the letter. Even with what we have now, we can show them from from what from the books they already believe in. Entire chapters came up missing, large passages came up missing, exactly. verses exactly. eaten by a sheep. You can line up manuscripts right beside each other, show them the differences. But man, if we actually have an entire book 
by a devout Muslim from a long, long time ago, the early centuries of Islam, and he takes you through the massive corruption of the Quran, man, our, our hope, our hope is that the Muslims, the Muslims who cling stubbornly to whatever their leaders and their parents told them, even though it flies in the face of what their God says, flies in the face of what their prophet says, flies in the face of all reality, all history, that we hope that they will eventually recognize, wait a minute, my leaders told me perfect preservation right down to the letter. All of the past 14 centuries of evidence tells me that is that is the most false thing anyone has ever said. It's the most indisputably false thing anyone has ever said because here are thousands and thousands of differences. Why did they lie to me? Wait a minute, my leaders told me the Bible's been corrupted according to the Quran. Well, well I'm opening up the Quran. The Quran affirms the inspiration and the preservation and the authority of the Torah and the gospel. Why do my leaders lie to me? And we eventually hope that there's a, a light switch moment when they say, gosh, yeah. everything these guys tell me is a lie. Why am I trusting them? I can't trust them anymore. I have to look into this for myself. And as soon as they decide they're looking into this for themselves, they are on their way out of Islam because their religion is based on submission to their leaders and their parents, yeah. not on submission to Allah and Muhammad. But once they, once they stop submitting to their leaders and their parents, there's no reason to submit to Allah and Muhammad because it's a false religion. Amen. And uh, what, a, what a great way to bring this to uh, a close, brother. And obviously, is there anything else, brother, you want to let uh, our viewers to know about some projects you're working on or video streams that uh, of interest to you that they will be aware of? Um, I'm actually going live with Sam Shimon. So people who are watching this later don't 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 think that I'm about to go live right after this. But if you're watching it live, then I'm going live on my channel with Sam Shamoon at eight o'clock. So one hour from now, um, and we're going to be responding to Muslim uh, objections to the deity of Christ. Other than that, people can always check my channel to see what uh, what videos are coming out. Yep, thanks for mentioning that. Mm -hmm. uh, it is quite possible, folks, that uh, Sam will be with me also on Friday. Uh, it's quite possible. Uh, once he confirms, I'll announce it. I'll have vocab on Saturday. And then Sunday is very special. I'm going to have a former Muslim uh, from the UK who will be my guest and uh, will be sharing uh, her story. Uh, so uh, please be on the look for that. Brother, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Of course, everybody, please, if you don't know, like I said, anything about David Wood, shame on you. You need to go to his channel. Shame. At Acts uh, Apologetics, uh, Acts, uh, Acts 17 Apologetics. And uh, I mean, just type David Wood, it'll take you there. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, our brother here, just like me, lives by faith. So we encourage you to subscribe if you're not a subscriber, give if you're not uh, someone who's giving through Patreon or any other means, and also join uh, his uh, channel as well. So thank you again, brother, for making time for us. We appreciate uh, everything that you do. And I'm looking forward, of course, to uh, another series. Possibly we'll do more of these live streams since we're mm -hmm. all bored to death sitting mm -hmm. around doing nothing, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very good. All right, my brother. Thank you so right. much. Thank you, everyone. God bless. Take care. Take care.